Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to this Friends of the South Grey Museum Speakers Series. Thanks to the Friends, this amazing Speakers Series continues, and we are back with another great and very interesting author and an exceptional subject. It's a subject which divided communities, a subject which created conflict in families, and it's also a subject which in some ways provided the impetus for women to organize into a league or into a union. As we begin this evening, we would like to formally recognize that we are meeting on Anishinaabe traditional territories. Once again, welcome. Thank you for your continued support and your interest. So what's tonight's subject? Well, on one side of tonight's subject, words such as bent, canned, fried, plastered, blotto, were common in common usage. After a night at the barrel house or gin mill or a blind pig, while imbibing too much hooch or giggle water, one might find themselves looking for the hair of the dog to cure a fuzzy head the next morning. But if you knew your onions, you would avoid the local constabulary on your way to your favorite juke joint. It was all fun and games until, in 1874, a storm came to town. A new movement. Its battle cry was, and I quote, the demon of rum is about in the land. His victims are falling on every hand. The wise and simple, the brave, the fair, no station too high for his vengeance to spare. O oh, women, the sorrow and pain is with you, and so be the joy and victory too. With this for your motto and succor divine, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine. Let war be your watchword from shore to shore. Rum and his legions shall reign no more. And write on your bonnets in letters that shine, lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. Owen Sound was swept into a war, a battle which would resonate for years to come, a battle which wives, mothers, and sisters would win. And tonight, our guest speaker will guide us through the trials and tribulations of this gray county conflict. Richard Thomas studied in Delta, British Columbia. He then went on to study broadcasting at Conestoga College in Kitchener, and thus began a career in radio. The radio station was CKPR in Thunder Bay. Following that, Richard moved to CFOS in Owen Sound for a rather briefer stint. 
From 1986 to 1999, he was a regional news correspondent for CKO, CKCO Television, Kitchener, and that was in the Gray and Bruce area. He once wrote, and I quote, when I moved to Owen Sound in 1986, I assumed, by, I, I was assured by many people that nothing ever happens here. I am pleased to report that they were incorrect. His biography reads like one from a Renaissance era. He is a historian, a broadcaster, a journalist. He served over 20 years on the Owen Sound and North Gray Union Public Library Board. Richard served eight years as a counselor for the city of Owen Sound. He was also instrumental in saving Owen Sound's Marine and Rail Museum in 2014. Richard has been awarded the Heritage Certificate of Recognition by the Gray County Historical Society. And in 2018, the Ontario Historical Society presented him with the outstanding award for service to Ontario's heritage community, the award called the Carnarvon Award. He has been the communications coordinator for the Blue Water School District Board. In 2019, or since 2019, I should say, Richard and his wife Morag manage the Owen Sound Farmers Market. As owner of Richard Tom Thomas Communication, he has extensive experience creating written web content for a range of clients and researching and writing museum exhibits. A lifelong reader, Richard began writing seriously in 1991. His first name, his first novel, I should say, was titled, entitled Gas Head Willie. And it was shortlisted for the Crime Writers of Canada Award, the Arthur Ellis Award, in 1996. Richard has at least, at last count, from my last count, some 22 published books. The fictional D.B. Murphy crime series, a series about a blacksmith in Owen Sound turned private investigator in the 1920s. Nonfiction bo non books pro profiling Owen Sound and area over the years. Photo books of years gone by and a recent book dealing with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Ladies and gentlemen, Tonight, we welcome Richard Thomas as he presents his speaker series presentation, Saints and Sinners, the story of Owen Sound, Canada's last dry city. Richard, let's give him a big round of applause. Well, thanks for that introduction. And yes, I am the poster boy for putting your ADHD to work. <laughs> you wondered about all that stuff. That's what it's all about. So I'm really happy to be here tonight. This is one of my favorite uh, talks to give because it's just such a crazy story. Um, it uh, began, I guess, uh, and make sure this works. Uh oh, it worked before. Ah, there we are. So Saints and Sinners began, oh, we went, there we are. It began as an exhibit I wrote a number of years ago for uh, Grey Roots uh, Museum. And prior to COVID, it had turned itself into a popular one-day summertime event at the museum. Uh, okay, that's right. It goes the opposite direction. Uh, and then it became, after the one-day event, it became a once-a-month, and this was my favorite one, by the way, a once-a-month summertime event in Owen Sound called the Corkscrew City Beer Bus Tour, which really just involved me driving around in a bus with a bunch of people drinking beer and telling stories about the prohibition days in Owen Sound. And I mean, could it get any better at all? Well, this is better, but yeah, it was, it was a great time. And we had included a, uh, a, a revivalist meeting uh, for the Prohibition Society, actually held inside the former Women's Christian Temperance Union Hall in Owen Sound. And these are some of the participants uh, that were involved in that. So it was lots and lots of fun. But what's it really all about? Prohibition certainly wasn't isolated. It happened all over Canada. The difference, I suppose, is that in Owen Sound, it lasted longer than in any other city in the country. One of the first things I remember learning about Owen Sound was that the sale of liquor 
had only been allowed since 1972. That's a fact that most newcomers to the area greet with an incredulous look. The other thing, by the way, that you always learn about Owen Sound when you first move there is that the map of on southern Ontario looks remarkably like an elephant if you tip it upside down. And Owen Sound is uh, cleverly situated just under the tail at the business end of the elephant. So that aside, uh, since moving here in uh, 1986, I've learned that the story of dry gulch, as they call it, is one of those stories that everybody knows, but very few people actually talk about in Owen Sound. So the Queen's Bush was the last frontier of Upper Canada, and as pioneer families began to farm in earnest, whiskey was their drink of choice. It was cheap and it was easy to make. All that was required was grain and a good source of water, and Gray County, of course, had plenty of both. It wasn't unusual for a farmer to take a container of whiskey to the fields with him, in her book, The Story of Canadian Whiskey, Lorraine Brown wrote, for factory workers, a coffee break was a shot of rum or whiskey at 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., provided by the employer, of course. Children were sent off to school in the morning fortified and warmed, presumably, by a nutritious glass of whiskey. This claim was borne out in a story told to uh, author Melba Croft by Owen Sound resident James Andrew, who was a ship's captain in later years. He attended the first school in Owen Sound in the original market building and claimed that a hollowed out log filled with whiskey stood by the schoolroom door with a dipper so that anyone so inclined, teacher or student, would not suffer the indignity of a dry throat during classes. Now it may also have taken the sting out of the uh, corporal punishment that was occasionally administered in school as well. The pioneers believed that whiskey was good for their health. It possessed important medicinal qualities there are a number of reasons they may have reached that conclusion. There was no soft drinks or fruit juices available, no refrigeration for milk, and tea and coffee was really hard to come by. Whiskey was often made at the local mill and sold for pennies, so it's not really surprising that it became the drink that pioneers young and old enjoyed. Whiskey produced at the Leith Mill sold for between 40 and 60 cents a gallon. Beer was the other drink of choice, it often being a low-alcohol brew made by using the same grain two or three times. As part of the brewing process included boiling, beer was often safer to drink than water. Throughout Gray County, wild hops can still be found, descendants of the hops first brought to the area by the pioneers. The second building, constructed in the village of Sydenham, as Owen Sound was initially known, was a tavern run by Hugh Gunn Campbell, and this is his stone from the Owen Sound Cemetery. In his recollections of early days in and around Owen Sound, Robert Crichton remembers Hugh Gunn Campbell. The first tavern in Owen Sound was built by Hugh Gunn Campbell, already mentioned. It was a log building of a story and a half high and stood on the site long since occupied by the Colson House. Campbell was a little Scotchman from Glasgow who did not much exceed five feet in height, but well and compactly built and must in youth have been a pert, active little fellow, but who later became a slave to Scotland's drink. The second public house in Owen Sound was started in 1841 by Thomas Rutherford in direct competition with Hugh Campbell's tavern. A second cousin to Sir Walter Scott, Rutherford emigrated to Canada in 1832. He sold the tavern to W.A. Corbett in 1845 or 46. In 1849, the village had its first serious fire when the tavern burned to the ground. The 1865 and 6 directory of the County of Grey described the first brewery in Owen Sound. Ridland Seacord's Brewery is situated on the west side of the river near the hill. The business was originally established by John Riddle Sr. in 1851. The present brewery was erected in 1857 and extensive additions made in 1861. In 1851, Thomas Scott established a distillery capable of producing approximately 180 gallons of whiskey every week, most of which was consumed locally. By 1852, Sydenham had been renamed Owen Sound and the population had grown to a stunning 868 people. There were two breweries and one distillery to serve them. Alcohol could be purchased in nine stores and three taverns. The same year a bylaw was passed by the Sydenham Township Council prohibiting taverns from being open before five in the morning or after 11 o'clock at night. The newspapers of the day were filled with stories of alcohol-related disagreements, crimes, and even deaths. One report was of a well-respected Sydenham Township resident, John Boddy, who'd come in Owen Sound one November day. 
At that time, it wasn't considered unusual for stores to keep a bucket of whiskey and a dipper on the counter for customers. Having done a fair bit of shopping that day, Squire Body found himself at the Exchange Hotel for lunch and, yes, more whiskey. Continuing his shopping after lunch, Body was ejected from a store for becoming troublesome after more whiskey. Helped to his sleigh by the shopkeeper, he was told to go home but didn't make it. His frozen body was discovered sometime later near the edge of town. The coroner ruled he had died of excessive intemperance and exposure. And in case you're wondering about the name, yes, Mr. Body was the great-grandfather of Owen Sound's present mayor, Ian Body. By the 1880s, the Eaton Brothers Brewery and Schwann's Brewery were the key players in the local market. The Eaton Brothers ran a large brewing and malting operation on 3rd Avenue West, producing ale, porter, and stout. By 1887, the brewery was shipping more than 6,000 barrels of beer annually across the province. The following year, Eaton Brothers installed an automated malting system, allowing them to produce 240,000 bushels of malt, up from 25,000. The Schwann family was associated with two breweries in the region, the Lion Brewery in Karlsruhe and Schwann's Spring Blank Page Brewery, which was located on 4th Avenue East at 17th Street in Owen Sound. And I've always loved this picture for some reason because this is a residential area now, but you can still see the corner of one of the walls of the brewery at the side of a backyard. Schwann's made lager, porter, ale, and bock beer. In 1899, a dozen bottles cost a dollar, and the factory was turning out 50 barrels of beer every single day. Ice cut from the bay during the winter was piled around cooling pipes that kept beer stored in the plant cold all year round. A chilled keg of beer often sat in the doorway of the plant for visitors to sample as they happened by. By the 1870s, Owen Sound was being described as a port town of between three and 4,000 people noted from Halifax to Vancouver for drunkenness and gambling. Small wonder. The community was given the nickname Corkscrew Town. Now, the generally accepted story about how it got the name is as follows. A man who was traveling across the country by train happened to have something potable, which he wanted to share with his fellow passengers, yet no device with which to open it. He was advised by a fellow passenger, just go up and down the train and see if there's anybody from Owen Sound here. They're sure to have a corkscrew in their pocket. And didn't it just happen like that? Uh, it was well known that people from Owen Sound always had a device on hand in case something drinkable came nearby. Now, by 1874, the ladies of Owen Sound were fed up with the public drunkenness, brawling, vagrancy, and lawlessness. This is Mrs. R.J. Mary Doyle, a member of the politically active Stevens family. She'd grown more concerned with each passing month by the tragedy and poverty she saw alcohol abuse causing. She called a meeting of the women of the town and formed the Women's Prohibition Society, which circulated a petition against granting any more saloon licenses. The group also petitioned the Ontario Legislature for amendments to the Liquor License Act. This group later became the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the first chapter of that organization in Canada. Believing that the abuse of alcohol caused unemployment, disease, prostitution, poverty, and immorality, the WCTU campaigned for the prohibition of all alcoholic beverages. The other main thrust towards prohibition came, of course, from the pulpit. The Sons of Temperance worked hard at promoting temperance in Owen Sound, and in 1878 sponsored a talk titled, Ought We to Have a Prohibitory Liquor Law? by Reverend Kennedy Creighton, the minister of the New Connection Methodist Church, located at the corner of 9th Street East and 5th Avenue. The talk was later printed by Rutherford Printers for wider distribution. Reverend Creighton didn't waste time in taking aim at temperance supporters who drew up short of prohibition. We are met at the outside by some well-intentioned persons who say, we are opposed to everything but moral suasion in this work and have full faith in its efficacy. There can be no doubt that on the principle of voluntary association and individual effort to promote temperance, immense results have been accomplished. Thousands of drunkards have been snatched from the very brink of the pit. At last succumbing to the pressure brought about by the temperance forces, Council passed a bylaw in 1875 to limit the number of licenses granted to 13 hotels, seven shops where you could buy spirits, and three saloon licenses. 
Now, if you're counting, that's 23 establishments selling alcohol to a population of 4,000 people. A lot of the trouble in Owen Sound occurred at Damnation Corners, the intersection of 10th Street East and 3rd Avenue where a tavern stood at each corner. The Grand Central Hotel, the Blue Moon, Warlow's, and the Pig's Ear each had a place at the intersection which was very busy at all times of night and day. It wasn't unusual in the wintertime to see a line of sleighs on the street during the afternoon. Farm wives were freezing in the cold waiting for their husbands to come out of one tavern or another. Just a block away was Salvation Quarters, the stopping point of Owen Sound's upstanding community members, with a church on each corner. Much of the tension around drink was centered on this block of 10th Street East between 3rd and 4th, Salvation and Damnation. The Toronto Telegram described Corkscrew Town in a news article. Drug stores, grocery stores, hotels and dives were stocked with booze. When the grain boats, lumber barges, and fishing craft docked, the sailors made a beeline for the brass rails. The saloons were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The bartenders worked in two shifts of 12 hours each. The sailors and the fishermen were obstreperous five days a week. Saturday night when the farmers came to town, supposedly to shop, you could feel the earth tremble in the township of Stony Kemble. Drunken gangs roamed the streets. Sober volunteers, hard to find, hauled the prostrate brawlers, heads bashed and bleeding by the harried constables to the lockup on drays. The horses didn't mind. Why no and sound horse would drink a bucket of beer like it was water. It was the Sunday morning hangover that sickened Owen Sound. To get to church, most of the faithful had to pass at least three saloons. Before the mothers and the children, the stews staggered on their rounds for the pick-me-ups that always laid them down. The regular Sunday spectacle caused a righteous revulsion. And that's how Owen Sound was seen by the rest of the country. In Preserving the Peace, A History of Owen Sound Police Force, there are several references to raids on disorderly houses, better known in the common vernacular as brothels. Housesville fame, or disorderly houses as they were known, were a fact of life in the hard-drinking, hard-playing port town. With the free flow of liquor that characterized early Owen Sound, there were many cases up in court blamed on the influence of booze and fast women. This combination occasionally resulted in violence. There was, for instance, the case of a shooting involving Nell Smith. For many years, Nell kept a place commonly called The Farm, up on Union Street, or the top of the 8th Street Hill. There was a man shot in a fracas, and several women ended up in the Mercer Reformatory as a result. In Owen Sound at that time, there were two town constables, and each was expected to work a 12-hour shift each day, seven days a week. With only one officer on duty, it meant that sometimes the busiest part of town was left unprotected when he was called elsewhere. On Saturdays, the shipyard employees received their pay, so Saturday was always a busy night. Having just a single officer on duty increased the risks, and it wasn't long before town constables began carrying weapons. Temperance supporters came in all shapes and forms. Owen Sound dentist Thomas Trotter, a reformed alcoholic himself, published life pictures from Rum's Gallery in 1886. In his preface to this series of cautionary tales, Trotter tells the reader, having for a period of my life suffered from the terribly seductive and treacherous power of liquor, and having by a fixed determination on my part and trust in the omnipotent been delivered therefrom, I am not conscious that I owe an apology to anyone for voluntarily taking my place in the ranks of an army that is now pushing the battle against a foe that spares neither combatant nor prisoner, and who has proved himself to be one of mankind's bitterest enemies. The book includes chapters with titles such as On the Scaffold Through Whiskey, A Fortune Squandered Through Liquor, Blighted Matrimonial Hopes, and of course the classic The Twin Demons, Infidelity and Liquor. As heavy-handed as his storytelling was, Trotter was reflecting the sentiment of the growing temperance forces. He concludes his book by suggesting that the reader can only arrive at one conclusion regarding alcohol. If a perusal of the foregoing pages has aroused in some a determination to place themselves in a right relation to the liquor question, or led any resolve on listing in the army that must ultimately prove victorious, a part of my object will have been accomplished. 
In addition to lobbying governments, the WCTU also organized an educational program that drew wide participation throughout the area. The union hoped that by enrolling children in the fight, the parents would be reached as well. One union declared that we have in embryo the future church, the future state, future society, and we may add future voters who we will trust to be able to think and act on this question intelligently. The organization targeted three areas, Sunday schools, young people's clubs, and the school classroom. They were less than successful getting the temperance message into the classroom, but as many of its members were Sunday school teachers, the WCTU was more successful there. In the early days of the union, temperance juvenile pledge cards were distributed to Sunday school teachers, but by the 1880s, the group had grown in strength and there was a growing expectation that children would take the pledge and join the temperance army. In 10 Reasons for Signing the Pledge, children were encouraged with arguments. It will save you from temptation. It will be a definite starting point in your history. It will save you time. After all, how many days in the week do drinkers spend in the saloon, at bars, and in social drinking, which is time worse than wasted? It makes a strong obligation, and it will be a great help to your neighbor and your weaker brother. Much life like pictures from Rums Gallery, other arguments included testimonials of the temptation presented by loose company, alcohol, tobacco, and the fates that might befall undisciplined youth. Interestingly, there were also stories for young women, but they focused on the importance and power of girls' influence on the much weaker young men. Songs and cheers were devised as well. Cold water, cold water, oh, that is the drink. How strange and how funny that any should think that whiskey or brandy that the government sell is as good as the water we draw from the well. Amen to that. At the end of each educational program or occasionally following meetings, children were expected to take the triple pledge, agreeing to reject alcohol, tobacco in any form, and bad language. Throughout Gray County, Sunday school programs were run by the WCTU, prizes were given to participants, and the results were always published in the local newspapers. Mary Doyle, that's her on the lower left in this picture, became known as the mother of the WCTU in Canada, according to the Gray County Histor Historical Society publication, Eminent Women of Gray County. She was a woman of strong convictions, it said, and was tolerant of everything except lukewarm workers against social abuses. She was described as a woman of poise, wisdom, and gracious Christian character. Unfortunately for Mary Doyle, she was not to see her life's work completed. Late in 1891, her health began to fail and she was confined to her room until her death in February of 1892. Two of Mary's daughters, Eva and Winifred Doyle, were proud members of the union and carried on their mother's work. In fact, they were involved with a group that purchased the Selden Hotel in downtown Owen Sound and ran it as a temperance hotel, meaning, of course, there was no liquor served, only soft drinks. The newspaper reported on the transition. On Saturday afternoon, in the last few hours, the bar was open on Monday. It was crowded with old-time customers anxious for a goodbye glass, and the booze was flying freely at reduced prices. The hotel closed on Monday morning, and at 12 o'clock noon, it reopened under new management and dry. The experiment of running the hotel without a bar will be watched with interest, the Sun-Times reported, not only by the citizens of Owen Sound, but by people throughout the province. Locally, the scheme is a popular one with a majority of the right-thinking people. Almost everyone is anxious that the enterprise will have a fair show. In the federal election of 1896, the Liberal government, I love this story, was uh, re-elected, but it did promise to hold a plebiscite on the alcohol issue. Finally, in 1898, the Prohibition forces felt that they were on the brink of a great victory when a national vote was held on the liquor question. The results of the plebiscite came in with 52.5% majority in favor of Prohibition. It was a great victory, or was it? Only 44% of the electorate had turned out to vote, well below the average for a general election. Prohibition had won by 13,000 votes, a margin that Laurier argued was far too slim to impose impose prohibition on the entire country. Quebec and British Columbia were totally against prohibition. Many liberal seats, including Laurier's, were in those provinces. Now it's important to stop for a moment and remember that the most tireless workers in favor of prohibition were Canadian women, 
many of whom believed it would improve home and family life. But they were unable to vote in the plebiscite. They had to rely on men to vote in prohibition. It took 30 years, but the WCTU finally got its wish in 1905 when the province of Ontario included a local option clause in the Liquor License Act. This allowed municipalities to choose whether to allow the sale of liquor or not. Owen Sound wasted no time putting it to a vote, and in January of 1906, voted to go dry by 1,238 to 762, a majority of 476 votes in favor. Seven councillors who ran on the prohibition platform were elected, helping to transform Owen Sound from corkscrew city to dry gulch. The local option impacted hotels and taverns in Owen Sound, but it was especially hard on the breweries. Eaton Brothers stopped making beer altogether in 1906 and concentrated on the production of malt, which was shipped across the country. Schwann's Brewery continued production for sale to wet communities such as Chatsworth and Wyerton. They also produced a low alcohol, which was 2.5%, beer for sale in local option communities. Prohibition may have limited the public consumption of alcohol, but its only real effect was to drive drinking underground and to turn regular citizens into criminals. Some bars in town installed buzzers to warn of an impending police raid. Others had two sets of taps, one with beer, one without beer. Bootleggers thrived, and throughout Gray County, stills could be found brewing up all manner of hooch for the thirsty public. Speakeasies popped up in urban centers, including Owen Sound and Hanover, and blind pigs, a lower class of speakeasy, were quite common. One legitimate local establishment found a unique way to serve its thirsty patrons. Coming in the door, you would surreptitiously hand your bottle to the doorman and then take a seat. Moments later, a china teapot full of your hooch and the correct number of cups would arrive at your table. Another method of obtaining liquor was by mail order from either Saskatchewan or Quebec, where liquor was still being produced. For several years after 1920, this was still possible because of a loophole in the legislation. For those nervous about flouting the laws, there was a legal method for obtaining liquor, albeit in smaller amounts. If your doctor was willing to write you a prescription for medicinal alcohol, you could receive up to a pint a week from a dispensary. The number of heart conditions and other ailments skyrocketed as prohibition continued. <clears throat> Passing a law declaring the town dry and making the town dry turned out to be completely different propositions for the politicians in Owen Sound. There were still drunks in the downtown. Empty bottles floated down the river to the bay. Where was it coming from? In his book, Owen Sound, The Day the Governor General Came to Town, historian Andrew Armitage wrote, Owen Sound businessmen, many wet to the bone, told the town where? J.P. Raven Banker. Illegal selling of liquor is now carried on in over 100 places in town. Under the license system, boys could not touch liquor. Under local option, they are carrying bottles. Elias Lemon, politician mayor-to-be and fruit and produce merchant, stated, Liquor is being drunk in five times as many places. While the grocer J.R. Brown explained, local option has created more whiskey drinking among young men than there ever was under a good licensed system. Owen Sound was soon referred to as the wettest dry town around. And in 1908, the successful candidate for Mayor Lemon called in four provincial detectives to get to the bottom of the problem. Armed with badges, pistols, and with the power of the law behind them, the undercover men went to work. Dozens of people were charged over a three-day period and were brought to court immediately. Unfortunately, there was one problem. The detectives disappeared. Court was adjourned while the search for the detectives began. When they were located in eastern Ontario and returned to Owen Sound, Detective Charles F. Stewart was asked why he hadn't appeared in court, and he said, My fellow detective told me on the evening of the 25th that we would be killed if we stayed in town, and, but we would be paid $500 to leave. So they met with Mr. Tucker, the defendant's lawyer, and a rail wor railway worker by the name of George Pumple, and they made an appointment to meet them again at the CPR station half an hour later. The two detectives pocketed the cash and climbed aboard the 1 a.m. freight to Collingwood with engineer George Pumple. When he was later called to stand, Pumple admitted that everyone in town knew the detectives had been bribed, but he refused to say who was behind it. 
So the local option was voted on again in 1913, and Owen Sound remained dry, but only by a margin of 120 votes this time. Owen Souders once again contemplated the local option question as 1915 came to an end. A petition was presented to the City Council and the town was in an uproar through November and December as the wets and the dries again faced off against one another. As always, there were questions about the validity of the names on the petition. On checking, it was discovered that 106 names on the 1,103 name petition weren't even on the voters list. On January 4th, 1916, the local option bylaw was once again upheld by a margin of 450 votes. Owen Sound would remain dry. But this was a greater victory than anyone could have known that day, for it was to be 33 more years before the local option bylaw would face another significant challenge. The dry days had come to stay, and the bootleggers were in business. Schwann's limped along selling beer to the 13 remaining licensed hotels in Gray County. Eleven of those were in Hanover. But when national prohibition arrived as a wartime measure in 1916, it was the end of Schwann's and Owen Sound. By the end of the First World War, the province began looking for the middle ground between the wet and dry forces. On October 23, 1924, a prohibition referendum was held in Ontario. Unlike earlier votes, which had asked yes or no questions, the 1924 referendum asked two questions. Are you in favor of the continuance of the Ontario Temperance Act? Are you in favor in the sale as a beverage of beer and spiritus liquor in sealed packages under government control? The dries carried the day 51.5% to 48.5%. Ontario would remain dry for a while longer at least. A few months later, the Conservative government of Premier George Howard Ferguson announced plans to begin debating the repeal of restrictions on the sale of beer to allow suds with a maximum of 4.4% alcohol to be sold. It was nicknamed Fergie's Foam after the pre-beer, who also announced there would be no further rep referendums on prohibition. The question would be dealt with by the legislature. In the 1926 provincial elections, the Conservatives ran on a platform of repealing the Ontario Temperance Act, increasing its popular vote to 57%, the Conservatives repealed Prohibition and in 1927 passed the Act to regulate and control the sale of liquor in Ontario. The Liquor Control Board and the Brewers Retail came into existence and Prohibition in some parts of Ontario ended. In Owen Sound, nothing changed. The long dry spell was just getting started and the local option remained firmly in place. The police continued to pressure bootleggers in the city and early in 1930 they made a great find according to the Sun-Times which reported on the search of the home of William Kadeski, which had long been suspected to be the headquarters of a local bootlegging ring. In their examination they visited every section of the house but finally concentrated their efforts in a closed closet off one of the bedrooms upstairs. There was nothing in this closet from a casual observation to indicate that it was anything but a place for the hanging up of clothes. It was finished in the finest cedar with the points perfect in every way and numerous poundings on the wall failed to indicate that there was an opening anywhere or that there was any vacant space beyond. To make assurance doubly sure, another clothes closet on the same floor was finished in the same manner. Three separate times the police were on the verge of quitting the place and they actually had their coats on but Constable McCaffrey was not satisfied and he decided to go back to the closet. He noticed that about halfway between the floor and the ceiling at one end of the closet, the cedar showed signs as though someone had brushed against it, the color being a little bit darker. He immediately went to work with some tools they brought along with them and finally succeeded in locating the door. With a large screwdriver, he came in contact with a hard substance which proved to be one of the brass bolts which operated on a spring which was controlled by electricity and was operated only by a push button in the main hall in the downstairs. The door was composed of five layers of material, including two of gyp rock, one of cedar, and two of another material. It was absolutely soundproof and its construction was that of a master workman. Inside was a regular bootlegging dispensary. There were 25 gallon cans of pure alcohol. There was also the apparatus necessary for the manufacture of real bootleg liquor including a large mixing decanter, bottles containing coloring material, and dope, which would leave one believe they were getting real scotch whiskey, <coughs> pardon me, 
but was part alcohol, part water, with some flavoring and color. But people wanted to drink, so they drank. Further changes to the Liquor Control Act in 1933 had local temperance forces worried, but Premier Hepburn assured the province that local option bylaws would be respected. Feeling better about that assurance, the dry forces relaxed a bit, but then began to worry that communities around Owen Sound would begin to apply for hotel licenses. This did happen, and it set the tone for the coming decades. Make sure I'm in the right place here. Owen Sound settled into a steady routine. The bootleggers kept the thirsty public well supplied, the temperance union continued to provide anti-alcohol educational programs, and everyone got along, more or less. By the 1940s, it had been so long since the last liquor vote that few could actually remember it. By this time, there were still bootleggers, but the days of the bathtub hooch and the stills like this in the woods were over. The rest of Ontario and most of the communities around Owen Sound were wet. So, if you owned a car, you could drive to the government LCBO stores in Southampton or Wyerton. The local bootlegging business was centered around the resale of alcohol purchased in the government stores. Out on 26th Street West, Marjorie Paul was the busiest bootlegger in Brook, as that area of Owen Sound was known. Her husband Clarence had worked as a boat builder at one point, but an accident at an Owen Sound factory had cost him all the fingers on one hand leaving him unable to work. With three daughters and a son to feed, Marjorie became a bootlegger to put food on the table. Her daughter Marlene Jackson told me that the Paul family didn't own a car, so Marjorie would call on friends to go to Wyarden or Southampton to buy beer. Once brought to the Paul home, the cases of beer were put into a secret hiding place known only to the family. A case of 24 beer in those days cost three seventy-five, dollars and it was resold at three beers for a buck. Many people would drink their purchase right in the Paul's living room, but some would take their beer home in a paper sack. In case of a police presence when leaving, the story was the same for everyone. This is my beer. I brought it over to share with the Paul's, but they wouldn't let me drink it here, so I'm taking it home. <laughs> now I'm going to let Marlene tell the next part of this story. It was the, 29th, the morning of the 29th of May, mm -hmm. 1949. The day before my 11th birthday, right. and Dad got into the beer, and he put back a hell of a parcel of beer. So when she came home, and she was working that night down, there was a man by the name of Pete the Popcorn Man, and he used to take his popcorn wagon all around the city, and he'd go down to the old arena mm -hmm. on a, uh, you know, hockey night or whatever, set up, and she would help him. So anyways, when Mom came home, she never even got in the house. Uh, we were in bed. And, uh, but we knew it was common. And uh, so they got into it, and uh, he knocked her right off the back porch and broke her jaw. Pete the Popcorn Man was just uh, getting ready to leave, mm -hmm. and he drove us all to, we, he, she got us out of bed, he drove us to the hospital, and there was the four kids and him and, and mom. And when we were leaving, Dad said, you can do whatever you want, but you'll not get the effing houses. I'll burn the effing thing down first. So while well, we were the hospital, that's what he did. Betty Bell Sargent told this story in Roses in December, her biography of her father, Owen Sound Mayor and MPP, Eddie Sargent, who many in the room will remember. And here's what she wrote. One night in May 1949, Eddie was sitting in his den with two friends when a knock came at his door. A passing taxi driver, Bill Palmer, drove into Eddie's laneway and gave the mayor the alarm for a house fire a block away. Eddie and his friends ran to the scene and heard a hysterical neighbor screaming that the children were still inside the house. They placed a ladder against the back porch of the house and Eddie mounted to a second story window, which he smashed open with his fists. Kids, come out here, Eddie shouted. Receiving no answer, he used a post that was handed up to him to break open the window the rest of the way so he could enter the attic-like room but a blast of black, hot smoke and fire knocked him backwards off the ladder and down to the ground ten feet below where he landed on a sawhorse. Now as he was falling, the 33-year-old mayor thought he saw movement inside the house, and despite his injuries, he jumped up and headed to the back door where he saw Clarence Paul, too drunk to escape the fire he had set, trapped inside the house. It took three attempts, but the mayor managed to save the unconscious man. That's when he found out that the children were never in the house at all. 
Eddie Sargent received the Dow Award for Heroism and national media coverage as a result of his efforts. When he recovered, Clarence Paul left his family never to be seen again. Marjorie and her children stayed with relatives for a few days, then moved back to the property. All that was left was a foundation and the main floor, no walls or anything else. Marjorie pitched a tent on the floor of the burned out house. There was a shed on the property used for coal and wood and eventually they all moved in there. And believe it or not, Marjorie resumed her bootlegging business from the shed. She later rebuilt the burned house and built another one next door, all with the proceeds from her bootlegging business. Now, Cars Taxi had a stand located at 293 10th Street East. Saturdays were always a busy day for the cab company. That's when Owen Sounders, who didn't own cars, went to Southampton or Wyarton to buy their preferred beverages. Ken Carr, the owner of Cars, told me that they were approached by the salesman for O'Keefe Breweries to operate between Owen Sound and Southampton to pick up beer and bring it back and deliver it to people. In order to do that, the taxi company required a special license from the Ontario Liquor Control Board to operate as a liquor carrier, and supported by O'Keefe's, they went to Toronto, applied for, and got the license. The deal was, if you bought a case of O'Keefe beer, it was free delivery. If you didn't want O'Keefe's and bought something else, it was 50 cents a case to transport it back to Owen Sound. Every afternoon, 2 o'clock was the cutoff time for getting your order into Cars Taxi. After that, one of the drivers would head to Southampton, which was the only store allowed by their special license. The deal worked out so well for O'Keefe's that the Shenley Distillery approached Cars Taxi and offered the same deal. If you bought a bottle of Shenley, you paid a quarter per bottle of whiskey for the transportation. But if you bought their Golden Wedding, delivery was free. Owen Sound resident Wayne King, a good friend of mine, his father uh, created E.C. King Contracting, many will remember them. Uh, he remembers the dry days really well as they played a regular part in his family life. His grandfather, Frank King, owned a livery business in Terra. Frank regularly met the train and delivered people's packages and parcels. He also liked to take a drink. The story in Terra was they had a horse named Barney, recalled Wayne, and Barney would bring him into Terra. Grandpa would go to the hotel and get pretty well loaded. They'd take him out, put him into the buggy, and Barney would take him home. Frank King eventually moved his livery business to Owen Sound, where he set himself up as a bootlegger at his house on 9th Street. All his life, he never had a Christmas with the family because he was so busy, Wayne told me. There'd be people there on Christmas Day wanting to have a few drinks, so he'd stay at home and serve them. Wayne's father, Elma, had been a machinist during the Second World War. On returning home, he and his wife took over Frank's business. Having acquired the public commercial vehicle license from the LLBO, they'd bring up to 40 cases of beer per trip back from Southampton to Owen Sound. Wayne told me on one of the trips, just after I was born, my mother was driving one of the transport trucks over to Southampton. It was in early spring. We were coming through the long swamp and I was in a bassinet. She rolled the truck. Nobody was hurt, but there was a lot of beer that got broken. A lot of sad people in Owen Sound, I guess. As boys, Wayne and his brother Robert would spend Saturday mornings in the garage sorting beer bottles to re be returned to Southampton because in those days, the bottles all had to be in the correct cases in order to be returned. A guy by the name of Lorne Wood, we called him Stinky, Wayne told me, used to come with his horses and buckboard. He'd have beer cases, and of course, the horses would have a dump in the yard, and we had to clean that up. Wayne used to collect bottles from the side of the road. They'd all be in cardboard boxes, and we'd have to sort them into cases. There was never an issue with legality, because King Transport had a license to bring beer into Owen Sound. Despite that, Wayne remembers that people were still sensitive about their beer deliveries. In those days, you'd get shunned, he told me, if people knew you drank. Quite often, the delivery driver would be asked to cover the beer up with something, like a blanket, before he brought it into the house, or quite often they would repackage it into plain cardboard boxes, because nobody would get that, right? I mean, you know. Owen Sound was soon surrounded with watering holes, which aimed to slake the thirst of the residents of Dry Gulch. Hepworth was a popular spot, just a short car ride from town. The Chatsworth Hotel was another popular stop for thirsty Owen Sounders. As a boy growing up in the 1960s, former Chatsworth Mayor Bob Pringle played hockey and lacrosse and often traveled to other communities on team buses. On the return trip, the boys from Chatsworth typically got dropped off in front of the hotel, which of course was centrally located. 
Bob told me on hot summer nights we'd make a trip down south on a school bus which the team would be privy to. I remember the school bus coming back on a couple of occasions on those hot, sultry nights, and it was like a fair out there in front of the hotel because people could hardly get in the door. There would be people standing outside, coming and going, because that was the only place to go. It was either there or Hepworth. There was nothing in Owen Sound. On some occasions, he recalled, it was difficult to get off the school bus because there was such a big crowd in front of the hotel. So for 33 years, there had been no challenge to the local option bylaw, but in 1949, that changed. In earlier plebiscite votes, the dry forces had been highly organized and the wets had simply voted as individuals. It may have been apathy or perhaps they were too busy drinking. The wets had simply never organized themselves and so had never been able to carry the vote. Ironically enough, the challenge for the wets as they organized was twofold. They had to come up with enough votes to overwhelm both the temperance forces and the bootleggers. Because when it came to the vote, the two bitter enemies stood side by side to uphold the local option. One side felt it was the right thing to keep Owen Sound dry. The other side knew that the local option was good for business. A wet newspaper editorial said it best, setting the tone for the campaign. Far and wide, this contest will be proclaimed by dry demagogues as a critical test of public opinion on the liquor question in Ontario. And every dirty design of such minds are capable of will be used to achieve victory for our side. Pulpits will thunder with denunciations of the demon drink. Prohibition parsons will join forces with bootleggers to keep the city clean. So the inclusion of the economic impact argument was the first time in this vote that the wet forces has actually tried to put a cost to prohibition. Did that slide change? Yeah, it did. Following the Second World War, the North American economy, of course, hit overdrive. The baby boom was in full swing, and the motor, by, motor vacation by car was the newest way for families to get out and see the world. The wets maintained that Owen Sound was missing out. The rest of the world had left prohibition behind more than two decades ago, and now the rest of the world was leaving Owen Sound behind as well. It was a heated battle between the two sides, which went on for months leading up to the vote. 12,600 were eligible to vote. By the time the polls closed, the result, Owen Sound, would remain dry yet again. 68% of the eligible voters cast ballots, and they once again gave the dry forces a decisive victory. A newspaper editorial tried to uh, put it all in context. A contentious local issue has been clarified. Now we of Owen Sound know where we stand. It was perhaps well that this plebiscite, the first in 36 years, was held. In that long period, there have been great changes, and there was a justification in the belief that opinion on the matter of local option should be put to this test at this time. That it was done and the results proved so conclusively that Opal local option remains the will of the majority should be a matter for general satisfaction. In other words, be happy, we're all dry, everyone wants to be dry, let's just get on with life. And that was a nice sentiment, but the bottle, so to speak, had been uncorked, and it would be impossible for Owen Sound to get the cork back into it for long. There were other plebiscite challenges. In 1952, the dries prevailed with simple majorities on all questions. In 1958, the wets were less than 2% away from achieving a 60% majority, which is what they needed. Still, Owen Sound remained dry. Then came 1961, when everything changed. In January of 61, Owen Sound City Council passed the bylaws required to hold another liquor plebiscite on May 27th. The date was set by the Liquor Control Board at Council's request. The decision wasn't unanimous, and the method used to call the vote was not usual. Past plebiscites had been triggered. There we are. Past plebiscites had been triggered when Council was approached by one group or another armed with a petition containing 25... Uh, containing the signatures of 25% of the eligible voters in the city. This time there wasn't a petition and no group requested the vote. The council members responsible for the motion felt that there had never been a problem getting signatures on the petitions in the past and as some downtown merchants were getting one organized, it just made sense to ask for the vote. The move would save time and money for the city. In every past vote, every petition name had to be checked and rechecked, a time-consuming process. The Sun-Times reported, 
It is of no personal interest to me what the results of the vote are, said Alderman Burke Walsh. I saw a petition from the merchants with 93 names on it, and I have no doubt that the 25% could be obtained. What I'm interested in is the saving of five to $600. The business community insisted that Owen Sound was losing business and missing out on tourist trade because of the adherence to the local option. The dry forces claimed it was the local option that protected Owen Sound from a descent into the chaos and lawlessness that had plagued its early years. The Sun-Times remained staunchly against alcohol in its editorials leading up to the vote. On May 11th, just a few days before the community would cast its ballots, the newspaper asked, what is best for Owen Sound? And I can bet you can guess what they said was best for Owen Sound. Staying dry. The editorial went on to describe the difficulties in sorting out what was the right thing to do in the coming vote. On one side of the issue were those hoping for a freer lifestyle, stirred up by those who hoped to make a profit from liquor sales. On the other side were those acting because of strong religious convictions and their desire to be their brother's keeper. The editorial further went on to point out that in 1960, $600 million was spent on booze, while only $203 million was spent on education and $83 million on health care. But of course, it wasn't the dollars and cents. The Sun-Times wanted its readers consider. There is the terrifying increase in the number of alcoholics from 1,150 per 100,000 in 1946 to double that number in 1960. There's the vast increase in the number of female alcoholics, the terrible increase in illegitimate births, many of them to girls in their early teens, whose story is so often a few drinks, the loss of restraint, and ruined lives. One of the greatest menaces from today's high alcoholic powered drinks is an actual death. Death on the highways, deaths in violence. Conservative police figures place a little over 50% of fatal accidents at the doors of drinking drivers. One is mentally open on the question. One need only mentally recall many district tragedies directly traceable to district drinking places. Now, to me, this argument is a little two-sided because Owen Sound was dry, so if you wanted to drink, you had to drive somewhere to get it, but we could go on and on about that, as they did for 66 years. In spite of its position, <clears throat> the Sun-Times made out really well in the leaks le weeks leading up to the vote, running ads from both sides of the issue. On May 16th, the drive forces ran an ad titled, They Want Us to Go Back to 1906. The ad included dire warnings, and there was a vast array of bootleggers, many of them operating wide open dives. Hubby Weed had a restaurant on Main Street. There were notorious places on the outskirts of the city, on the Meaford Road and the Chatsworth Road. Their women were famous. But Aggie Thomas was perhaps the most famous of all. She operated on the corner of 8th Street East to 3rd Avenue. Aggie and her associates had uh, moved uh, when had moved to Owen Sound when local option came into being, and then she went to Wyerton. A group of citizens there finally decided to take the law into their own hands and drive her out of Wyerton. Aggie shot and killed one of the aroused citizens at 10 p.m. in 1907. She was acquitted of manslaughter and left for parts unknown. In fact, somebody called me last week that was related to Aggie Thomas looking for information on her. The Wets, they stuck to factual ads and arguments. On May 18th, an advertisement indicated that 95.4% of the downtown businessmen supported legal control based on surveys of 188 businesses in the downtown area. An appeal from the once temperance Selden Hotel encouraged voters to approve dining lounges. A yes vote would create 60 new jobs, the equivalent of a new industry in the city. It also observed that Last year, a reported 500 yachts visited our neighbor, Port Elgin. In the same period, Owen Sound had three of these craft. You are aware of the exceedingly good harbor and beauty of Owen Sound's bay. According to yachting publications, we in Owen Sound miss their lucrative trade because of the lack of complete facilities for the purchase of all commodities in our city. Booze, in other words. So in the vote, it wasn't on prohibition, which they would vote. May 25th, just two days before the vote, the Drive Forces published an ad titled, We Can Vote, no We Cannot Vote But, and it was appeal from temperance supporters in the townships, oops, I skipped ahead one, hang on. 
from the township surrounding Owen Sound include the names of hundreds of people. Our plea is that you vote to keep Owen Sound the fine city it now is, that we can continue to enjoy its shopping centers and its various facilities free of liquor and beer sales promotion centers. The following day, the wet forces printed their own ad addressed to the citizens of Owen Sound. It included the names of many leading citizens who supported legal control and they urge you to vote yes on all three questions on Saturday and make Owen Sound a bigger, better place in which to live. Finally, the day of the vote arrived. The weather was perfect that Saturday in May. People turned out in record numbers to cast their ballots. A 60% majority was required to defeat the local option. In total, almost 85% of the eligible voters attended the 27 polling locations that were set up throughout the city. The first returns began to arrive at approximately 8.30 and rolled steadily in after that. By 10 o'clock, the results were clear. The long drought was over. Owen Sound had voted to allow the Brewers Retail and Government Liquor Store to shut up, set up shop in the city. But dining lounges were turned down. 50%, 56% voted in favor, too few by 4% to allow restaurants and bars to serve alcohol. Despite the vote, it was to be a while before Owen Sounders could make their own purchases, but on November 1st, 1962, the liquor store and the brewer's retail opened. Eddie Sargent's newspaper, the Owen Sound Herald, carried a special section welcoming the two stores to town. The Herald also ran an editorial under the headline, Another Right is One. After 56 years of fighting legal sale of beverages, the Temperance Federation of this city will hardly feel joyous today. He couldn't help but rub their noses in it. The majority of Owen Sounders will simply admire the two fine outlets and remark, it's about time. There will be readers who will say that the opening of these stores is the first step towards a disastrous increase of alcoholics and unfed children. But there will be more of you who will realize that legal outlets are, at the very least, much better for a community than illegal ones, and that the overcoming of prohibitionist resistance is a step towards progress for Owen Sound. Well, I'm not sure about all of that, but the editorial pointed out that 70% of all Canadian adults were drinkers and the taxation of alcohol had become an important source of revenue for the government. It went on to blame the temperance forces for the high taxes on the producers of alcohol. <laughs> 75 guests attended the opening of the Brewers Retail Store before being treated to a dry luncheon at the Downtowner Hotel, also coincidentally owned by the mayor. It was store number 295 for the Brewers Retail, which had been supplying the ale and lager needs of Ontarians for 35 years. The sky didn't fall, and Owen Sound did not return to the corkscrew town days as the dry forces had predicted it would for more than 50 years. Nor did it experience sudden prosperity as the wets had claimed. Life went on as usual for most people, and the amount of illegal and illegal activity aimed to slake the thirst of Owen Sounders slowed to a snail's pace. For the cab and bus companies, there was no longer a need to carry booze from Southampton to Owen Sound. The special licenses ended, and once again, a cab was just a cab. Slowly but surely, the bootleggers started to go out of business. With the arrival of the beer and liquor stores in 1962, they were no longer needed, with the exception, perhaps, of an occasional after-hours purchase. The defeat of license premises in 1961 as well as in subsequent votes in 1964 and 1967, ensured business remained steady at the watering holes that dotted the communities around Owen Sound, including Duffy's in Hepworth, the Pacific Hotel in Wyerton, the Chatsworth Hotel, and others. But whether they knew it or not, the end was in sight. The final push came from the Owen Sound Chamber of Commerce, which conducted a survey in which more than 50% of respondents wanted another vote on the issue in 1972. On March 6, City Council passed a bylaw authorizing the vote to be held May 13th. As in the past, the media played a significant role in both campaigns with newspaper ads and radio coverage widespread. But there were a couple of key differences. It was shorter, a shorter campaign by a couple of months. The dry forces were diminished due to age of its members and the mainstream media, including the Sun-Times, were publicly in favor of a yes vote. And the 60s had empowered young people and awakened them to the influence that they could have on society. 
The other major societal change brought about the, by the 60s, of course, was the arrival of recreational drugs in the mainstream. Almost every edition of the newspaper carried one or more stories about the growing drug problems with marijuana, LSD, and speed. These made alcohol, a well-known and well-understood intoxicant, seem far less dangerous to some. Leading up to the vote, the Wets ran a low-key campaign that was aimed at getting people out to vote only. Twenty telephones were manned by volunteers who made a point of contacting every eligible voter in the city. With fewer members, the drives ran a non-confrontational campaign and focused most of their efforts on newspaper ads encouraging citizens to vote no. One, titled What Fuddy Duddy Still Opposes Pubs, admonished drives who were thinking of switching sides and assured them they'd been brainwashed. If you've slowly but surely begun to give in to the brainwashing of the Hockey Night in Canada ale ads, and you know the ones we mean, Just waiting for it to switch over up there. I couldn't miss an opportunity to get the theme song in there at least once in my presentation. That's good. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so the Wets continue to advocate, uh, the Dries continue ad to advocate to keep Owen Sound dry. The April 28th edition of the Sun-Times was a veritable juggernaut of support for the yes vote. Mayor Bob Rutherford announced at a public utilities meeting that if Owen Sound voted wet, there was a good possibility a new motor hotel would be built near Owen Sound on Highway 6 and 10. And this is the one that I love. PUC engineer John Gernon suggested the city develop a master plan for the area since the city may eventually want to annex the area as far south as Rockford. Now, I don't know if you drive that highway today. I can't imagine Owen Sound stretching that far. The Wets decried the announcement as a tactic to sway the vote. Finally, the Sun-Times editorial that day was titled, Liquor Vote, Time to Remove the Barriers to Freedom of Choice. And it explained that the executive of the Grey Bruce Regional Tourist Council, who many will remember, had taken a realistic attitude and issued a statement supporting Owen Sound going wet to help support the tourism trade. Denied the, I'm not getting a change there. Do I have control again, Tim? Hmm. Ah, there we are. We'll keep moving here. Denied the editorial might of the newspaper because of its change of heart, the dries could only respond through advertising, which the Sun Times is only too happy to sell. Finally, on May 4th, the drives were featured in a page two story. Rather than a traditional interview with a reporter, campaign chair Harry Logan, an 81-year-old farmer from Sarawak Township, asked that questions be submitted in writing. In view of the editor amazing editorial support the Sun-Times under its recently arrived editor, yes, an out-of-towner, is giving to the vote yes committee, I am most reluctant to make any statement unless it is in written form, he added. Our big hope is that there will be a big vote. Mr. Logan said in one of his written replies, the wets will get all their supporters out, they have a marvelous system, but then they have plenty of money behind them. Hmm. Okay. The story directly below, oh, thank you. The story uh, directly below that, focusing on the wet campaign, painted a different picture. Located in the basement of the old post office, which Eddie Sargent happened to own, Strangely enough, the space was painted institutional green and the only furniture was wooden lunch tables and chairs. Campaign chair Bob Gallen refuted the dry belief that the campaign was well funded by outside liquor interests. There isn't one single dime coming in from out of town from liquor companies or anyone else. I'm vitally interested in the well-being of Owen Sound. The liquor facilities will help Owen Sound. He pointed out the issue is an economic one. There's no question about the goodness or badness of alcohol. It's not what we're voting for. Every place around us is wet. So advanced polls were held on Saturday, May 6th and Monday, May 8th in Owen Sound City Hall and the voter turnout was heavy with about 400 people casting ballots. The day of the vote, 12,245 people were eligible to vote beginning at 8 in the morning and the turnout was heavy all day long. By the time the polls closed at 7 p.m., 9,233 people had cast ballots. 
The first two polls to report discouraged the wets. The nursing homes had voted no. Can you flip me there, Tim? Those early results were soon followed by poll after poll voting yes. By the end of the night, it was clear that the long drought had ended. After 66 years, the last dry Canadian city had finally approved the sale of liquor in bars and restaurants. Owen Sound Mayor Bob Rutherford said, Owen Sound can now offer better facilities and, men and amenities to tourists. I hope we can all pull together to make for a more prosperous city. We've been through a highly emotional vote that has tended to tear the city apart. Slide, please. Not everyone was happy with the outcome. At the South End Fellowship Baptist Church on Saturday night, Harry Logan and the Dry Forces watched the polls reporting with complete dismay. When it became obvious Owen Sound would be wet once more, the Dries wasted no time in blaming the Sun-Times for their dramatic loss. The Sun-Times had a very definite part in swinging the results to the wet side, charged Mr. Logan. An evangelical minister and member of the Vote No Committee, Reverend Robert Willoughby accused this newspaper of non-objective reporting. Mr. Logan said a number of people were seriously considering cancelling their subscriptions to the Sun-Times. Slide. On January 10, 1973, at the Downtowner Hotel, owned by Mayor Eddie Sargent, the Black Light Lounge was the first lounge licensed to open in Owen Sound. Slide. Patty Bell Sargent described the day in her book, Roses in December. It was a gala occasion when beer and liquor were sold legally in Owen Sound for the first time in 67 years. Television cameras recorded the drama as Mayor Bob Rutherford had the first drink. He made a speech when the lounge opened, scuttling Owen Sound's re reputation as the last dry city in Canada. Slide. That may have been the end of the story, if not for the Heritage Place Shopping Centre, which some of you may have been to at one point or another. Construction started on it in 1987, and in 1988 it was announced that Andre's Wines would have a store in the mall and Smitty's Restaurant would have a small lounge. As opening day drew nearer, both were surprised to learn that that area of Owen Sound was still dry. It had been annexed from Sydenham Township and had not been a part of the 1972 vote. Slide. In the 1988 municipal elections, a plebiscite with just two questions was added to the ballot just in the area where the mall was located. Are you in favor of the authorization of Ontario wine stores for the, for the sale of Ontario wine only for residential consumption? And are you in favor for the sales spirits, yada, 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 at the restaurant? The vote passed and Andre's and Smitty's were both allowed, allowed to sell alcohol. Slide. In Owen Sound, the local option was aimed at ending the rampant drinking, drunkenness, and rowdyism that had plagued the town. The net effect of the bylaw was to drive the drinking underground and to turn anyone who liked an occasional drink into a criminal. And there were a lot of criminals in Owen Sound. Drinkers continued to drink, law or no law, and an entire industry sprang up around making sure there was never a dry throat in the community. It is the prohibition that makes anything precious, Mark Twain said, and he may have been referring directly to Owen Sound. The only real effect of local option was to divide the community in a battle that lasted nearly a century. Thank you. I know that was a lot to take in in a very short space of time, or maybe not so short. Woo, not so short. Uh, any questions, anyone, uh, that I could answer uh, just while I'm here? There was a brewery in Chatsworth, but that's the closest. I suppose that now the Mudtown Station, which is in our former CPR station, is a small craft brewery, and that would be the only brewery in Owen Sound at this point. I may be among the hopeful that uh, it won't last that way for long. We'll have a few more. No, uh, no distilleries in Owen Sound, though, and the closest winery is uh, Coffin Ridge in the former Sydenham Township, now Meaford. But that's close enough, I think, to count. Yes? Well, first of all, thank you for an astounding presentation. And I apologize if uh, you actually answered the question in your presentation and I missed it. But I'm wondering whether, on a larger scale, Owen Sound experienced something that Markdale experienced on a more modest scale uh, during the uh, Prohibition and Temperance era. And that was the degree. Between the uh, uh, Protestant community 
I didn't find anything in my research. Uh, to, to me, the churches were all pretty unified together against uh, the use of alcohol. And I think part of that might have been the fact that Owen Sound was just so nasty before 1906. And, and you know, when we, we talk about population of Owen Sound, you have to remember that uh, when the CPR made Owen Sound its uh, eastern terminus for its Great Lakes fleet, that increased shipping through Owen Sound to such a magnitude that more than 100,000 people a year transients came through Owen Sound and included in that 100,000 a year were 24,000 sailors. So when they came to Owen Sound, things got wild. So I think that the churches were all pretty well unified as far as that goes and, and that, that's all I know about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I will thank you all for your attention and uh, have a good evening. And the book is for sale over there in case you'd like a copy. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was extremely interesting, having worked in a hotel when I was a, high, a university student, I should say. Um, I'd like to also mention, ladies and gentlemen, that, that the, the books, the fiction books, there are a series of four, I believe. The uh, DB8? Eight. 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 Oh, you must have been because my research only showed four, but the eight is perfect. And they, are, they basically all take place, they are murder mysteries and crime, crime stories taking place in either Owen Sound, there's Wyerton, Owen Sound, Mackinac Island, um, White Cloud Island, places like that, Manitoulin. And they're phenomenal and interesting ones. And the one is related basically, it's uh, Wet Willie, what was it called? Gas Head Willie. Gas, Gas Head Willie, related to alcohol itself. So it was an amazing situation, an amazing history, but the, the novels are even more interesting than reality sometimes. Ladies and gentlemen, we have tonight an evening, uh, this evening a very special presentation from the Friends of the South Gray Museum. And the protocol for the presentation will be as follows. Barry Penhale will introduce the presentation. The members of the Museum Advisory Board, along with Peter Whitehead, the curator, curator and Colleen Boer, the chair, will then come forward. Steve Plenner will make a presentation. And Steve, of course, is the treasurer of the Friends. And there will be remarks offered from Colleen and Peter after that. And following that, you're invited to come to forward to take photos of the event if you so desire. So I now turn it over to Barry. Thank you, Terry, very much. I hope people don't mind that I speak from this chair. Uh, I was reminded by Richard's presentation of our great Canadian humorist, Stephen Leacock. Uh, if you know Leacock's story, you know that probably the place he enjoyed the most on this earth was his place at, Pimis, at uh, Brewery Bay, uh, Brewery Bay being on the water at Aurelia. And uh, uh, when uh, he was there, uh, having a little break from his uh, uh, time as a professor at McGill, uh, he would relax fishing and canoeing, but he liked to drop notes off to some of his admirers and some of his friends. And on his little note uh, paper was the name of his location, Brewery Bay. And uh, uh, he said uh, on many occasions when he was giving talks, you know, he said, people have received those little notes from me. And he said, I've known total abstainers to become intoxicated just at the mention of Brewery Bay. <laughs> Typical Leacock. We have a, a very special evening here tonight uh, in many ways. Uh, it's been a regrouping time for the uh, Friends of the South Gray Museum, and I'm happy to tell you that the legal work is underway that will see us very shortly being known as Friends of the Gray Highlands Museum. We are taking that step to be in step with our friends at the museum. Uh, we incorporated as a not-for-profit, small, volunteer-driven group in uh, 2013. 
And uh, a number of you who are here tonight know of the many uh, events that we were able to stage. Uh, our annual March recognition uh, in her birth month of Agnes Campbell McPhail. Uh, the uh, annual Canada Day breakfast at the Kinplex, and of course our speaker series. But you also know how much organizations were really flattened by COVID. And uh, it's, it's a rebuilding period for organizations right across our province and across the country. And that's no different for us as friends of the Grey Highlands Museum. So we just want you to know that we're with you, we're supporters uh, of the museum as we've been. It's been a bit of a haul to regroup, uh, to find a new home here in Ansley where we've been warmly received and to uh, uh, start to make our impression again to be the supporter we have started out to be for the museum because our role, our mandate has been and remains to be supportive of the museum, to increase recognition of our museum, but also, of course, to raise funds when we can for the museum. And if I can just digress for one moment, Richard in his presentation made mention of the Ontario Historical Society. The Ontario Historical Society, a remarkable group, they were the people that, I believe, organized and incorporated the South Grey Museum, now the Grey Highlands Museum. And they were the people in 2013 who incorporated us. And with us tonight, having come in from his farm in the Beaver Valley, is the very recently retired executive director uh, of the Ontario Historical Society, Rob Leverty. I think he deserves a hand. Now we have a, a, a great uh, presentation to do. I beg your pardon? Yes. I was about to uh, say, and, and I'm glad that Jane was in sync with me on this, that I think it's important that you know that uh, we lost during COVID about three years uh, of performance. Uh, we lost those opportunities to have silent auctions and uh, raffle ticket draws and things that were profitable uh, that enabled us to be uh, sort of a benefactor, if you will, for the museum. Uh, the old days may come back, we hope they do, but in the meantime, we looked at our records and we realized that we had donated over $15,000 to the museum. And tonight we will be, uh, through our treasurer, Steve Planner, presenting uh, the museum with a check for $1,100. So we continue to be supportive. Steve. At this point, we'd like to call Colleen and Peter forward, please. Terry, if, Terry if, if I may, I think I still have a live mic. Possibly this is the time to invite some of the others to come up and join them for a group photograph. So done. <laughs> Would other members please of the Museum Advisory Committee please come forward.
Absolutely. So it won't be long. Um, my name is Peter Whitehead. I am the uh, Community Heritage Curator for the Municipality of Grey Highlands and more succinctly, the Curator of the Grey Highlands Museum. So thanks to the dedication and ongoing efforts of the Friends of the Museum, we all had an opportunity to gather here tonight for another great speaker series event that not only shares or shines a spotlight on some fascinating local history, but it also keeps the museum vibrant in the minds of those who attend evenings like this throughout the year. And, um, and it was a fantastic presentation to the point where halfway through I wondered if I was going to be able to drink in Owen Sound on the weekend. So that's, that's pretty impressive. As a current curator, I wear many hats. I'm a storyteller, I'm a, uh, a writer, a designer, uh, but more importantly, I'm a, a cheerleader for the museum. But during the nearly 50-year uh, history of the museum, my participation is the equivalent of a, a very small brush stroke on a giant uh, canvas. I merely grabbed the baton from the previous curator, as they themselves once did, and have tried uh, to work uh, in a direction that keeps the Grey Highlands Museum moving forward. And I'll continue to do that uh, until it's time to hand the baton off to the next caretaker. But amidst all those changes, the constant that makes my job so much easier can be seen really literally in this amazing space today. There are so many audience members here and uh, watching at home that have either donated artifacts to the museum over its lifetime, uh, liked or shared posts on social media, or come physically to the museum to help solidify gallery stories. And they continue uh, to expand and grow our footprint. It's the community's involvement. So we have board members, uh, many of who are here tonight, um, some past, some present, uh, some who have volunteered their valuable time, in some cases, literally for decades, to ensure that our, do our doors remain open. And of course, we have our valued association with the Friends of the Museum under the longtime leadership of Jane and Barry. So everyone literally in this room tonight deserves a round of applause for your ongoing support. Uh, we all understand here the importance of communal storytelling, we realize what a gift we have in the Grey Highlands Museum and really how blessed we are that the municipality truly understands and values the importance of our shared cultural heritage. So thank you for this gift. Uh, Jane did send me a note today and talked about the numbers that the museum had raised. Uh, we had a discussion of the best way to utilize this donation and we all agreed that enhancing our external uh, signage, our new signage, with solar lights is just a monumental step forward for the museum. So thank you for your continued support uh, and bravo to everyone here for your uh, continued active participation in the museum. So on behalf of the museum and the municipality, uh, we are committed to continue to grow by extending uh, a handout to partners that we've had, future partners that we're still searching for and of course, harnessing the, the passion and power of our community. So thank you. Pauline, do you wanna say thank you? Well, thank you to everyone tonight for attending. Uh, a special, special thanks to the friends for all the support from over the years, Barry and Jane, uh, without your energies and, and, and Steve, well, your whole organization uh, has allowed us to grow and offer new things at the museum that we wouldn't have been able to manage without your support. So thank you so very, very much. And thank you to Peter for his vision that he's bringing to our Grey Highlands Museum with a new refreshed interior. And as soon as the construction is more finished, people will be able to access it more readily. So I invite everyone to please come and take a look at the new refreshed space inside the museum and come and help us celebrate our community. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Colleen and Peter. 
Once again, it's almost time for tea, coffee, and mingling and, and asking questions and, of course, purchasing any of the books that you like that our special guest has authored and would be pleased to autograph. As for two lucky people, if you'd pull out your tickets now, please, it's time for the draw. We have three tonight. And I would ask, what's going to happen is this. If you're the lucky person, please stand up, and Steve will come and deliver your draw, draw gift prize to you. Shall I? Without looking, the first lucky number. The last four numbers are 3600. 3600. Three six zero zero. Someone has it. Three six zero zero. No. Going once. Three six zero zero. Going two times. Three six zero zero. Oh, if. <laughs> Must be Ron. <laughs> Give it, pass it on. Pardon me? We'll pass it to Ron. Ron, you're the only one. Is everybody else have their ticket? We'll do a process of elimination. If you all have your tickets and he doesn't, then Ron must be the lucky winner the first time. Agreed? Yep. All right, thank you. Thanks to our guest presenter, a copy of his book, Saints and Sinners. There's an older book uh, from my library uh, called Simply Booze, which was a classic book by a wonderful writer from Western Canada. And would you believe it, we learned today for the first time that Richard is a chocolatier, and so the third prize are truffles that he makes that are only available at the Owen Sound Farmer's Market. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Richard, thank you for those two gifts. Appreciate it. Very versatile, from books to chocolates and truffles to say. All right, the second lucky ticket, the last four numbers. And if you find yours, Ron, and it's this one. <laughs> the last four numbers are 3597. 3597. Oh, yes. You'll take the chocolate. <laughs> I'll hold that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And while Steve's coming back to save him the trip, I'll pull the third number. The third lucky ticket, last four numbers are... Three six one six. Three six one six. Right at the very back. Three six one six. And those are our lucky draws for this evening. Congratulations to winners and thank you, each and every one of you, for being here. The Friends of the Museum have committed to a six program speaker series in 2024. They've also committed to a special Agnes McPhail program in March. Barry's mentioned these earlier. And again, hosting the popular, very popular, Canada Day Breakfast on July, July the 1st. More information on these events will be coming in the beginning of the next year, the year 2024. How many of us believed we'd ever see the 2020s? Amazing. At least for me, anyways. And that's maybe because of the booze. <laughs> As always, we wish to sincerely acknowledge the support of this speaker series by the Municipality of Grey Highlands, the Ansley United Church Events Group representatives tonight. Let's give them a round of applause and thank them again. <laughs> Additional thanks are extended to our much valued community partners, Stevens Restaurant of Markdale, Highland Grounds of Flesherton, and Ron Barnett for his poster graphic design services. 
Thanks to all the friends of the South Gray Museum and Barry and Jean for continuing this speaker series. And once more, a special tip of the hat to the direct, goes in the direction of our man up top, our guru of technology, Tim Riley of Leaking Ambience Studios. Thank you to all of them. Once again, thanks go to each and every one of you for your attendance this evening. I'm Terry Mokri, your Master of Ceremonies. And on behalf of the friends, please accept our most sincere wishes for a happy, healthy Christmas and holiday season and a very, very happy and prosperous new year. Until we meet again, keep safe, keep well, keep healthy. Thank you.